Ellen is someone who was always confident and independent, and to me as a child seemed to be able to chart her own course. You know, in the family, I think we joke about the fact that she was very comfortable being a judge, telling other people what to do with the with the power of the law behind her. And like a good judge, she could temper her、uh, authority with mercy. The most important thing for me about Ellen was really her ability to lead a genuinely egalitarian life. That it really was a kind of triumph over our upbringing. That you could claim a kind of gender equality, but you could live it. Whatever she was doing, she was also engaged in bringing other women along and in connecting with them. Ellen's way of exercising change is something that I admire. I grew up in Evanston, where Ellen grew up. We got to know each other in junior high. She saw the world in the way that I was trying to see the world, which was, you know, person by person and not who you know. She was interested in people and wanted to be friends with them and to get to know them better. As a prosecutor, as a judge, now as Attorney General of the State of Oregon, these are not positions that have always been held by women, nor have they been held by women whose attention is focused on the vulnerable. I think that's been a theme of her entire career to create opportunities for others, whether through the law or through mentorship of people practicing law or in the administrative fields that she's held. I think that her goal was not necessarily, you know, to be the Attorney General of Oregon when she grew up, but rather to be in a position where she could do something for people. Ellen, I'm super proud of you. Always have been, and thank you for being such a great friend to me. She is our first woman attorney general in this state. This is not an anomaly. This has been an example of someone who has done her work and shows up as a beacon for so many people, women, and other people who can aspire to be like her because of her intelligence, her tenacity, her humility, and her true desire to serve all Oregonians. She has made a tremendous contribution in terms of increasing the number of women who are judges, women who are seeking political office across our state. She walks with you. She doesn't walk in front of you. She will protect you. She will shield you. But she walks with you, which encouraged me to walk with others. Throughout her career, Ellen Rosenblum has been a breaker of ceilings. Whether it was pioneering the job sharing program at the U.S. Attorney's Office, or finding a way for women lawyers to network in the '70s, or becoming the first woman to serve as Oregon's Attorney General, she has always inspired me because of her ability to just keep pushing and finding ways to make this profession and our state better for everybody. And I think Ellen looks at it from how do we make people into good lawyers? And it's a much more successful strategy if you're looking to make the profession less white and less male. She wants to humanize the legal profession so that people coming up behind her have a broader access to becoming a lawyer, a judge, and it's really important because the bench and bar needs to reflect the population it serves, and it doesn't yet. But if people take the approach she's taking, it will eventually be a more diverse, more inclusive place. Good afternoon. Wow. Thank you to the video team and to my brother Peter, my dear friend Chris, our Justice Nelson, and my former clerk Heather. For your kind words, I am truly touched. First, kudos and sincere appreciation to our intrepid leader, ABA President Trish Rifo, who, along with her predecessor Judy Perry Martinez, has done an exceptional job of navigating our association through the pandemic this past year. Of course, you might ask, what would you expect from two such amazing women lawyers? And thank you to the ABA Commission on Women in the Profession, its chair Maureen Mulligan, and staff for bringing us together year after year, rain or shine, for the Margaret Brent Lawyers of Achievement luncheon. I always look forward to this event with excitement for my annual dose of women lawyer bonding and inspiration. This year is different, of course. No salads, 
only virtual hugs, but still loads of inspiration. I feel so honored to be here beside these four remarkable women, the Brent class of 2021, and the many who have come before us on whose shoulders we stand. I've only missed one Margaret Brent luncheon. That was for my mom's 90th birthday celebration. Today, having just turned 96, mom, I'm happy to report, is tuned in from Evanston, Illinois, where I grew up, along with family and friends from all over the country. Thanks to each and every one of you for your love and support. A few other thank yous are in order. First, to those who nominated me and supported me for this award. Andrew, Yvonne, and Seth, you guys simply rock. I've come to find out that this triumvirate of Oregon ABA leaders was joined by the leadership of Oregon Women Lawyers, my wonderful former judicial clerks, friends from the National Association of Women Judges, former ABA officers whom I've had the honor to get to know and work with closely over the years, and last but not least, my friends in my current world of State Attorneys General, or AGs as we refer to ourselves. Most important to today's occasion, all of these great leaders in the law truly believe in supporting and advancing women and diversity and inclusion in our profession. So a big giant thank you to all of you and a special shout out to my current and former AG sisters who include former California Attorney General and now Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, Maine Governor Janet Mills, Nevada Senator Catherine Cortez Masto, Chicago lawyer Lisa Madigan, and the women AGs of New York, Massachusetts, Michigan, Delaware, Hawaii, Florida, Wyoming, Arkansas, and yes, even the Virgin Islands. Talk about women whose leadership is deeply inspirational. And now back to today's moment, I'd really like to use it to leave you with a rosy picture of where things stand for women in our profession today. After all, my state now has its first woman Chief Justice, and a majority of the judges on our Supreme Court are women, including Justice Adrian Nelson, whose voice you heard in the video, and Justice Lynn Nakamoto, our first Asian American justice, who was a 2019 Brent honoree. My law school, the University of Oregon, has a black woman dean. Back when I began law school in 1972, there was not even one full-time woman faculty member and women comprised four, that's four percent of all women practicing law in the United States. That percentage is now 37 and over 50% of law students are women. So now more than four centuries after the namesake for today's luncheon, Margaret Brent became America's first woman lawyer can we finally say women have fully arrived in our profession? Sadly, the answer has to be no. Here are a few of the reasons why. Women, after all the trouble they go to, to become lawyers still leave the practice of law in unacceptably high numbers. Women of color are only a small percentage of lawyers as shown by the recent ABA publication entitled Left Out. Pay equity remains a serious issue. And although there is certainly progress, there remains a glass ceiling to be cracked when it comes to partnership and other perks of the profession. The work of the Commission on Women in the Profession, since its first how-to manual on combining family and career, which was published in 1988 under the leadership of its first chair, Hillary Rodham Clinton, has been groundbreaking and nothing but breathtaking. But answers and solutions continue to stymie even the smartest and the most committed among us. Let me say this as fervently as I can. The Margaret Brent Women Lawyer of Achievement Award means nothing. If we who receive this honor do not redouble our efforts, we must ensure there's a pipeline of women lawyers. And by that, I mean, including women of color, LGBTQ plus women, and women with disabilities, we must ensure women will receive a legal education without the burden of substantial debt and will be presented with opportunities on graduation and beyond fully equal to those of men in the profession. This includes the equal chance to make partner, become 
lead corporate counsel, judge, dean, tenured law professor, and yes, attorney general. The disparities that persist, whether for the past 400 years or just the past 10, must be eliminated. And to those of you in the audience, won't you please join us in this commitment? Today's world is beset by so many challenges, the climate crisis, racial injustice, economic inequality, just for starters. Women know how to rise to and meet any moment, no matter how difficult, but will never reach our full potential as solvers of important legal problems if we don't have our places at the table. Every twist and turn of my career confirms that basic belief. Thank you again to the ABA Commission on Women in the Profession for doing your part to boost us up and for including me in this year's wonderful class of Women Lawyers of Achievement and for holding this fabulous and truly inspiring event. I look forward to next year's delicious salads and some real hugs.